Welcome to this presentation of Aklawaha, Tales My Father Told. Following the presentation, we will have a making of Q&A session with some students from PK Young Developmental Research School and the creative team behind the film. Aklawaha. The name sounded magical to my ears. My father said it was an Indian word for muddy water, but to my young eyes, the river was a glistening jewel, full of life. Being on the river formed my earliest impressions of the world as a place of endless bounty. I imagined myself aboard one of the old-time steamboats, standing on the deck with the wide-eyed tourists as they too were transported into the mysterious realm of an untamed land. Magnificent birds roosting in the mossy live oaks, startled turtles leaping from the glistening roots of cypress trees, and fearsome alligators, their prehistoric eyes probing the surface of the ancient river. A boy with a fishing pole held a world of promise in his hand. In my innocence, I believed that the river and those who loved to be there would be forever free. Every turn in the river brought discovery. 
One day, I would be able to name all the sights and sounds and smells. But at first, it was all I could do to spread my arms wide and take it all in. We came upon some hidden springs where I could dive into a swirl of fish to where the clear water bubbled up from beneath the earth. When the river ran free, locals could feed an afternoon church picnic with the string of fish they had caught that morning. I walked along the river of dreams, lost in time and space, and had never felt more at home in the world. I lost all track of time in the woods along the Aklawaha. I was a kid explorer in an untamed land. As our boat slowed, my father began to tell stories of the long history of the river. He told me that Indians had once lived on the very spot where we were camping. I exclaimed, where are all the Indians? He told me that the ghosts of Indians past were all around us, in the name of cities like Ocala and Palatka. Even the mighty St. John's was once called Welaka. Around the campfire, my father told me of the Seminole Wars and how escaped slaves and the Seminoles fought to protect their territory. When the great Seminole chief, Osceola, was told to sign a treaty confiscating his people's land and that the Seminoles would be banished to the Oklahoma territories, he slashed the treaty with his knife.
As we passed an old abandoned plantation on the river, my father told me about the history of slavery and the efforts to ban it. He told me about the long buildup to the Civil War, which exploded when Abraham Lincoln became president. We passed Sharp's Ferry on the river, where near the end of the war, my father said a battle to end slavery was fought.
My father told me that soon after the Battle of Sharps Ferry, President Lincoln, who had ended slavery, was assassinated. He turned to me and said, God never created a finer man than Abraham Lincoln. Our country had lost a great leader. Later, I came by a whites-only sign. I turned to my father, who explained what the sign meant. I learned that not all was settled by the Civil War. In my youth, I thought that people, nature, the river were always free, that freedom triumphed over everything. But in the tales my father told me, I learned over time that rivers and people must struggle to remain free. When I was in college, I returned to the river, hoping to experience the sense of joy and freedom from my childhood. Where I had once paddled freely to the St. John's River, a dam loomed before me, and the once meandering waterway was a straight ditch. On the bank, there rose a huge tree crusher. I sat there in a watery grave of dead trees, trying to make sense of it all. I would discover that the gem-like springs into whose depths I once dove were now invisible beneath the dark depths of the damned Oklawaha waters. Now manatees struggled to make their way past the dangerous dam. Once the Oklawaha River, the heart of the great Florida Riverway, nurtured an expansive cypress forest, crystal blue springs, vibrant fish migrations, and thriving wildlife. I wondered to myself, where were the great schools of catfish and striped bass? Where were the American shad and mullet? Now, these wonders must live on in photos and in the stories our fathers told and in music. Like the swirling of the Silver River currents by the mighty Oklawaha, a sight so magnificent it can inspire a symphony, we see that life flows on and freedom and justice can prevail and triumph.
the river was magical to me. Whether in cypress or pine trees above, passing along shores or beneath the water below, new life was everywhere. In the end, I discovered that music could bring me closer to nature, and nature could be celebrated in music, that art can transcend time, and the boy and the river can be reborn. Hello and welcome to the making of Aklawaha, Tales My Father Told. I'm Houston Wells. I'm a senior lecturer here at the University of Florida College of Journalism and Communication. And we're joined in the WUFT studios today with some of the creative team behind this project. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and, and introduce them now. Uh, we have uh, Sabrina Alfonso, who is the musical director and the conductor of the South Florida Symphony. 
Uh, also with us is Jackie Pickett, uh, and you are a double bassist with, uh, with the South Florida Symphony, and you performed uh, in this production. Um, to my right, Steve Robitaille, who is uh, kind of playing double duty here. You are the president of the Florida Defenders of the Environment, and you're also the film's writer and producer. Uh, to my left, I've got John Gotch, who is the composer of this symphony, the Oklawaha Symphony. Uh, and then we've got Mark Emery, who is the director of photography on the project. And down here on the end, we have Lars Anderson, who is a Florida naturalist and a historian. So welcome, everybody. Also, I want to recognize that also joining us in the studio, we've got uh, several students from the P.K. Young Developmental Research School, from Lisa Fabulich's science class, and they're here to, uh, well, actually, these students have had an opportunity already to view the film, and several of them have come to uh, ask some questions of their own of the panel. Um, so we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. Before we go there, however, uh, Steve, I have a question for you. How did you first happen to learn about well, John and the Akwawaha Symphony? So as somebody that doesn't usually turn to social media a lot, I saw a post that said that there was a symphony named Oklawaha Tales My Father Told, and our organization has been trying to restore this river for decades. And um, so I was very curious. I contacted the symphony. Um, they sent me a copy of the score. I listened to it. I was just astounded by the beauty of it. And um, a year later, here we are. We've, we've made this wonderful film. So let's go to uh, some of the students in the studio. And Gargi, I understand that you have a question also for, uh, for Mr. Robitaille. Um, if you'd like to come up to the microphone. Mr. Robitaille, um, why did the Florida Defenders decide that they wanted to produce this film? We've made films before, but they were environmental films. They were more journalistic. Um, um, and when I heard this symphony, I realized there was a different way to reach an audience and that was through art, and particularly to an audience of people of your age. This just seemed like a golden opportunity to uh, send this out into the world and, and, and make people fall in love with the river. You're the writer and the producer, and producer is a little bit of a vague term. Can you tell me what, what you did as a producer for this project? It's almost like, what didn't you do for this project? The producer is sort of the glue. I mean, uh, the first thing you do is you bring together the team, and here's the team. Uh, I'm, we're missing Dan Bram, who edited the film, and when you, if you've seen the film, you know how absolutely beautiful he has taken Mark's work and, 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 and put it all together. That was, I knew I wanted an historian on the project, so I called Lars, um, and uh, I'm very lucky to uh, be working with Mark because Mark is really sort of the Oklawaha cinematographer and filmmaker, Emmy Award winner and, you know, just incredible, incredible talent, beautiful film. And then, of course, to work with this unbelievable orchestra, you know, and, and we were able to film this in the, at the New World Center in Miami uh, where they have a 14-camera operation. So when you see all these instruments during the film and they're popping right out at you, and, you know, uh, that's because we had all of these different video feeds that we could draw from to, uh, to film that. So I believe we have another question from one of our students. Dex, where are you? Coming up. Here. So I have a question for you, Mr. Gotch. What like gives you or like what makes you want to make a symphony? Traditionally, a symphony is a large orchestral work that <clears throat> has a full complement of instruments, such as the strings, the winds, the <clears throat> brass, and the uh, percussion, and is usually divided into four movements. And you may have heard Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, where the first movement goes, dun 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 dun. Well, many symphonies have abstract themes, but Beethoven's next symphony, his sixth, has suggestions in the music about nature. And <clears throat> there's a music that recreates a running brook and uh, a thunderstorm. There's so many references. It's referred to as a pastoral symphony. But longer orchestral works that invite you, inspire you as the listener to imagine a particular story is called a symphonic poem. And that is the musical structure that I chose to write the music 
to uh, describe my travels with my father down the Ocklawaha River <clears throat> in the 1950s. Now, why did I choose this particular story uh, for my symphonic poem? Well, it was Mark Twain who famously said that if you want to write a good story, write what you know. And my most enduring memories of my childhood were traveling the Yakawaha River with my father, listening to these uh, stories. And even though large parts of the Yakawaha River have been ruined by a dam, you can visit the Yakawaha River and travel it. And I'm sure if you do, you will find it as enchanting and as mesmerizing as I did when I first visited it uh, some 60 years ago. So what are the scenes and the emotions and the historical events that I wanted to recreate for you, the listener, uh, in telling my symphonic poem? Well, first, I wanted to create a sense of the mysterious beauty of the, of the river and the wildlife utilizing minor keys. I then switched to a major key to portray the exuberance and the joy of a young boy discovering this, this river. And then the music switches to minor key, keys, uh, somber keys to portray the uh, stories of the Seminole Indians and their Seminole Wars and their dramatic music to recreate Chief Osceola stabbing the Treaty of Surrender. The music continues in these minor keys to uh, tell the story musically of slavery and the Civil War and the lament for the death of Abraham Lincoln. And then for the finale, the triumphal finale, the music switches back to a uh, major key to celebrate the, the joy of human freedom and a hope that a boy and the river can be reborn. To bring a musical tapestry to life uh, required a magnificent orchestra. <clears throat> and a um, superb artistic director such as uh, Maestro Alfonso, and a, extraordinary musicians and dedicated musicians to rehearse and to bring this performance. And so grateful to uh, Miss Pickett here, who is uh, just a wonderful uh, double bassist. Grace, I think you have a question for, uh, actually you have a question for the musical director of the South Florida Symphony. Uh, Sabrina Alfonso. Hi. How did you become a um, conductor when there's so few women conductors? And what drew you John's symphony? Well, I grew up in Key West. I don't know, you know, where Key West is. I, I'm literally a sixth generation conch. So I've been down there a long time. And I can honestly say I um, probably was in music most of my childhood, but not in orchestral music. And uh, I had was drawn to being a conductor actually in seventh grade. In sixth grade, I, I was in band, ensemble, um, but I was not very inspired. I had a, a, a male conductor, and it wasn't because he was male, but I, he just wasn't inspiring to us. But then the next year, he left, and a woman named Martha Stock, who was from Key West, but actually came here to get her, um, came here to university, got her degree here in music, came down, and I was so inspired by her her love of the music and how she presented it to us, that, that I knew right then and there I was going to be a conductor. And I can honestly say now, I mean, if you know, you wouldn't have the same path that someone like myself. I had to create a lot of my own work, my own orchestras, because women weren't really being given opportunities. But I'm really happy to see the women out there that are, are doing very well and are commanding big orchestras. And, you know, someone asked one time, was it important that, you know, young people see someone like themselves? And, and I said, yeah, because that's what drew me to being a conductor, not necessarily 
because I was going to be in music, was a woman conductor. But also, or, orchestra, to get into orchestra, I was in ninth grade. I happened to live in Italy for a year. I was, I was on a field trip and got lost, kind of walked away from my group and ended up in this beautiful theater. And I walked in, and it was the end of uh, opera. The whole audience was crying, I mean, just bawling. I, I was like, what the heck is going on? And there's this woman on the stage singing this beautiful music, and you know, the muff, I'm giving away what opera it was, the muff comes rolling down the, the stage. And uh, that ha opera happened to be La Boheme by Puccini, which is probably one of the most famous operas ever written. And I knew then and there there was more to music than just wind ensemble and becoming a band conductor. Not that there's anything wrong with it, because it, it gave me my start. So um, that's really how I came to it. And then I, the rest is just you know education, working, and going to different um, festivals and just getting out there networking but you know constantly learning new repertoire because you have to have a lot of repertoire under your belt. Did you discover this this symphony or how was that brought to your attention? So John and I kind of met from Key West and um, he had sent we had I'd already done two of his works um, previous to that and honesty for me I love music that is and all his stuff well, his music that I did had stories, and that it, in some ways that's really a lot easier to grasp because it, there's a depth to it that maybe just a written piece doesn't have, and and so you know it makes it easy easier, makes it more fulfilling to try to see his his vision. Um, but when he came with that, I mean, the piece was it was really magnificent. It had some beautiful solos, and of course my musicians were dying to play it. Um, but also, you know, my my heroes are sort of Shostakovich and, the, and Beethoven because they write, you know, for the, of their time. They write about the politics or of human uh, humanity, and you know, and, and John was doing his part in writing about a, a river that was very important, but important to him, but is also important in in this world and in the state and to young people having all of the things that he had and that I had as youngsters. So, you know, the piece became, I think, out of the three for me, it was really like the most special. And I just thought, um, as did everyone, that, it, and as did our audience, that it was really um, brilliantly written and um, honored to be a part of this. Excellent. Thank you. Now, Malaya, I think that you have a question for uh, our double bassist from the, from the symphony, Jackie Pickett. Hi. Um, so my question is what was it like to see yourself perform and see how the poem coincided with the music? Modern technology has really made it possible for symphonic musicians, because we play mostly in a live setting, to see ourselves as other people see us. So there has always been a rarity of seeing African-American symphonic musicians. So there's two ways that I feel when I see myself on film. I sort of get this surreal experience of there's someone who looks like me playing this beautiful music on stage, sort of like when I was a child, younger than you, watching people perform on stage and seeing that rare African-American symphonic musician because there's lots of people of Af African-American descent playing popular music and, and jazz, but in this particular setting, it's still a, f a novel phenomenon. So I have that experience and also the experience of what John and Maestra were referring to in the music as having a cause beyond just the notes. We're telling a story. Art has always, classical music has always been about revolution and really getting people excited to take action to move forward their human condition 
and make things better. Redemption is what you were talking about in your story of the, I'm going to give it a shot, the <laughs> Aklawaha yeah, River. This is something that particularly drew me to Maestra Alfonso's orchestra. The fact that she is a woman out there doing something to make a difference in art when she could have easily said, no, I'm a victim of, they won't hire a woman, so I'm just going to sit there and complain. No, she just went out. What an incredible example, what a lesson. She just went out and said, I'm going to make my own orchestra. And here we are today because of that. Okay, that's part one. Part two of your brilliant question was how music reflects the text. Okay, I'm going to get a t tad bit technical. Uh, music is a highly mathematical concept, and everything in the universe operates on frequency and vibration. While we're playing a score, we're reading the universal language, at least in Western music, of, of notes, notation. And so the composer wrote from the very beginning, from the lower registers of the orchestra, eighth note subdivisions, eighth notes and eighth rest, that go from the lower instruments through the higher instruments of the orchestra. And this gives us a feeling that we're traveling down a river. It, we're going somewhere. It, it's called text painting. And it heightens our senses when the music, the sound reflects the words or the, the libretto, the poem, the text. And it allows the listener to become more connected to the film. Did you hear how the music changed when the boy would jump in the water and the boy was in the boat? How there were scenes as you were traveling where the music got thinner and it got thicker. It, there's more stuff going on. And this is a, a common technique called text painting or in 20th century, in music, modern music, it's called Klangfarben Melody, where you're using sound, which is of the few pieces that I've played of our composer, John. Uh, he really, to understand what he's doing, you've got to understand that concept. And you have to be ready to flow into your part, because your part is coming from you're finishing a line that someone else hasn't yet completed. So it's, it's almost like a marriage, a good marriage, of words coming, finishing each other's sentences. And that's what helps the music to me as someone who's playing it and uh, following the conductor's direction that's what makes it exciting and, and what makes the music reflect the poetry and gets the person in the audience involved because it heightens all of our, our senses. Did you feel like you were traveling down the river too when you saw it? You can say no, it's okay. It's, not, it, it's, not, it's different. That's the beautiful thing about art. You have different ways of responding to it. But um, I would say a vast majority of people who listened to it felt, I know I did when I listened to it, I felt like I was going down the river too. Uh, we have uh, a question from Alan. Come on up. And do you have a question, I understand, for uh, the director of photography on the film, Mark Emery? How did you get into nature filmmaking and how did you get such cool shots of wild creatures like alligators? Initially, most of us like wildlife, right? I mean, if you when a hand raised, everybody would raise their hand, oh, I like critters of some kind, whether they're your pet dog or, or something you saw out in the field that you really love. Uh, in, in my world, that was the same. I, I grew up in the woods, and I hung out in the woods all the time. I felt better there than I did anywhere else. I, so I watched behavior on animals. And when you watch behavior on people, you pick it up real quick. You know, if you're a little bit nervous about something or you're happy about something, it's revealed very quickly 
Well, guess what? You can do the same thing with a lot of animals. And when we started to learn how to make wildlife films, there were no schools for it that I knew of uh, in, in the United States. There may have been a few, but there, were, there wasn't anything significant that just worked on wildlife. So I worked on uh, movie crews and so worked on major motion pictures and all kinds of uh, commercials and things like that with a guy named Jordan Klein. Jordan is now 98. He invented underwater cinematography. He made the first underwater cameras that worked. And he also made the first scuba tanks that worked. This man is a genius. He lived across the lake from me, so I could hop in a little John boat and drive over to his place. And we filled up our tanks right there because he made the first compressors that worked for scuba. So we did a lot of underwater filming first, which to me was very freeing because, you know, with behavior on alligators particularly, like they're in the film a couple of places, uh, that's not easy to get. And I ended up also working as a young man before I went to work with Jordan with Ross Allen, Reptile Institute. And so we would milk rattlesnakes and wrestle alligators five times a day for two bucks an hour. <clears throat> I needed to work my way up. And, but at any rate, you did learn behavior. You knew when you were getting ready to catch an alligator, you had to really watch it because they can take the end of your finger off in about two seconds. And you also had to learn uh, if you're going to film, if you're using movie cameras, they didn't work like video. You couldn't throw it away. Every 400 foot of film was about $400. So your nickels went out of your pocket real quick. And so you had to learn how to do that. And so I ended up going to 35 countries, filming all over and doing all the same lessons that you would learn on watching a horse, a dog, several other animals. You can apply to so many other uh, critters when you're filming out in the wild. And then it was learning the technical part, how to do that. And with the Jordan Klein group, uh, they, they, did, they started with the Creature from the Black Lagoon, Flipper, Jaws, Splash, Cocoon, The Abyss, major motion pictures. Uh, and, and so I got great coaching from them. And at times they even lent me cameras to use that I didn't have the money for. At the times, a 35 millimeter camera was 800, 80 to, to $100,000. And they sent me one up one time to Alaska and I, I shot the bear catching the salmon at the waterfalls for National Geographic down the road. And so, so we did a lot of different filming in a lot of different places, but it's learning that behavior that helps you make films on them and helps you even fall in love with the sport of filmmaking. For this film, it was very interesting because we had something I had never done before. I had done natural history filmmaking all the way through. And they're called blue chips, so there's no scientist. You have to just do behavior. And so it has to be really something interesting for you, everybody to watch. And both my parents were classical musicians. So when we got this, I went, oh, man, I got to do this. This is great. And then to talk to John about his story, well, my, my dad died when he was a young man also. His dad passed when he was young. And both of our dads took us up and down the Oklahoma River. So I live 15 minutes from there, and I started filming even before we started working with him and had a lot of footage. Uh, the wildlife stuff in there is right on the river, most of it. And, and so what you're seeing is what you might see on the Oklahoma. You want to be honest to the, the picture, or it's within five or ten minutes of, of the Oklahoma River, and so it's native to that area. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and uh, Declan, I think you have a question for uh, Lars Anderson, who is our resident naturalist and Florida historian. So like, what do we know about the Native about the Native Americans before they got taken away from the Oklawaha? Okay. And also, like, how did they use the river as like a resource? The Native Americans that are alluded to in this uh, video have had a relationship with the Oklawaha River for dating back fifteen thousand years. So it's a, a long relationship with humans and the river. Um, in those early 15,000 years ago, when people first arrived in Florida, and I know that scares you here in 15,000 years, I'll go quick, I promise. <laughs> but uh, it was the end of the last ice, last ice age. Um, the climate was very cool and dry at that time. So most of the rivers that you see around Florida were very dry, were just these old channels that had been formed millions of years earlier, but they were dry now. And the only water sources in Florida were the spring heads, where now the springs were just these isolated pools of water including Silver Spring and some of the big springs on the Okawaha River that are, most of them are under the reservoir itself now. Um, so just very important water sources for them. The wildlife would come to those to drink and the people needed that water to drink. So as they're following the herds around, you see here about paleo Indians following the Mastodon herds around. They couldn't just blindly follow the herds. They had to also be thinking about where those water sources were. Uh, the sinkholes, Silver Spring now. And so it wasn't until about six or 7,000 years ago as the climate warmed, getting out of the ice age and got uh, cool, uh, warmer and wetter, I mean, um, that the springs, the water table rose, they overflowed their banks and filled the old channels again. And now the people, the Native Americans had water sources to 
uh, for more food, fish, and such, and they could also travel by canoes other places. Um, so it just changed the landscape of Florida completely six or 7,000 years ago. So half the time humans have lived here, they didn't have such flowing water like the Okawaha. The Okawaha is unique in that way because we know from the soils and the marl, it's called in the river, that one actually filled in quicker, much earlier than most of the rivers in Florida. So the relationship between humans and Okawaha goes back thousands of years further than most of the waterways and the Native American relationships with them. So it's a it's an old relationship that people have had with that, and um, they've used it ever since for transportation, like I said, and for food, and things like that, and uh, continue to use it to this day for recreation and everything. Thank you, Lars. Uh, so Madison, I believe you have a question for our composer, John Gotch. Hi. So um, in the poem, you bring up freedom multiple times. Do you think that the river could be seen as a symbol of freedom? The concept of freedom can raise complex questions. One question about any defined freedom is, as you well know, the freedom to do what? So I'm sure you're wondering when you're going to be able to have the freedom to drive and have more uh, freedom to do things socially. But some have considered uh, the freedom the freedom to dominate others, uh, such as confiscating their lands, that's what happened to the Seminole Indians, or enslaving others for their free labor. So yes, the free-flowing Oklahoma River was a metaphor uh, for me as a symbol for uh, enduring basic uh, freedoms for humanity. And the you could look at the dam on the Akawaha as an extenuation of that metaphor of denying certain human freedoms. So uh, that's one of the concepts that I had. But there was also a literal one, an explicit plea that someday that the Akawaha will become free-flowing again. So uh, those were sort of the uh, themes that, that ran through my mind also. So. Thank you for your question. All right, thank you. Uh, and uh, Tatiana, I believe you have a question for uh, the producer and writer of the film, Steve Robitaille. Um, so how do you envision the impact of this film on raising awareness and fostering a connection between viewers, especially the younger generation in the Okalawaha River? Good question. Um, when I heard the symphony or the symphonic poem, um, I'd always been looking for an opportunity to reach viewers in a different way than other kinds of documentaries and uh, you know political campaigns. I wanted to reach the heart as much as you know the mind or the intellect. Um, and there's a line in the film that nature can bring you closer to art, and art can bring you closer to nature, and this seemed like the perfect vehicle for that. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful film, and I want to thank. Uh, the students of P.K. Young, who uh, had the opportunity to uh, not only view the film, but come here and, and share with us their, their thoughts and questions. Uh, we appreciate you. I also want to give a big thank you to our panel here, who lead uh, busy, exciting lives and took some time out to join us here in the WUFT studios. Uh, and I want to thank you for joining us at home.